All right, good morning. Did everyone have a nice uh, long weekend? It kind of makes Tuesday all the more difficult, right? Like my kids this morning were like, I don't want to. <laughs> I was like, I don't either, but I'm glad you said it instead of me, right? They were throwing a tantrum this morning. They're like, we slept in, isn't it summer? I'm like, no, no, it's summer's over. It's a long way away. But uh, hopefully it was nice and relaxing, really, really hot. Obviously we got a couple more days of heat, but did you see Saturday on the weather forecast? Did you see there's a chance of rain on Saturday? I don't, I don't know. It probably will disappear by tomorrow. But like I was beyond excited that there was a chance. It's like at 50 percent. If it's over 50 percent, it might happen. <laughs> if it's under 50, forget it. Right. Yeah. On Saturday. Yeah. Did it? Like yeah. Terrible. Hot rain. And it was like. Yeah, I couldn't. Like a thing. Yeah, hot rain's not the best. I don't know if anyone else got. Uh, there's a little bit of lightning. Like I was sitting there, and my phone was a lightning strike within five miles. I was like, I ran outside. Like there's like two clouds over there. I guess maybe over there somewhere. But um, yeah, hot rain's not the not the best. Not not when it's 110. 110 is just awful. We went to the beach to try and get away from the heat, and it was 97 at the beach. I was like, yeah, this was a failure, but at least there was water. I don't know. So uh, anyway, it's supposed to start cooling down a little bit. So we'll hope for the best. Um, I also want to apologize. I, I gave a lot of you extra anxiety for no reason, and I'm so sorry for that, or extra stress. Um, how many of you saw my announcement about the, the homework that I sent out? If you didn't, it's probably good, it's right? Um, right you're, you're start now I get stressed today. Uh, so I'm going to be giving you a homework assignment today, but I accidentally put the date wrong in Canvas, so it went out early. If you've already read the article and done the homework, you are miles ahead of the game. Hold on to it. I will be collecting it from you on Thursday. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I will talk about that at the end today when we get there. So I'm so sorry for those of you who are like, is there homework or did it early? Thank you for those of you who are so on it. That's fantastic. And uh, the rest of you will talk about it soon, and that's totally fine. So uh, we'll keep going where we left off, and I do have a little um, article that I'm going to have you read before I see you next class, uh, but I apologize that it went out a little bit a little bit early. Whenever I uh, set up a new Canvas course, it imports it from the last semester, and I forgot to change the, uh, change the date that it went out, so sorry about that. But uh, what we'll do today, we'll keep going. Uh, we ended last time with intelligence tests, and we talked a little bit uh, about IQ, and we took that little um, little test, which hopefully you thought was was kind of fun. We'll talk about a few other methods today, and then we'll get to the idea of diagnosing and how we arrive at a diagnosis. So uh, another type of, of uh, assessment that we can do is uh, an observation, right? A naturalistic observation, or we can also do something called an analog observation. Naturalistic observation is exactly what it sounds like. You are observing someone in their natural environment. It's almost like a people watching with a purpose, in a sense. I don't know if any of you like people watching. I love people watching. It's so fascinating uh, to do, especially at restaurants. I like guessing if it's like people's first date or how long they've been together. You can't be too creepy about it, but it's fun to like kind of, you know, guess and watch and observe. This is, is doing that, but with some kind of specific goal in mind. So maybe you're watching children playing on a playground uh, and you're recording, thank you, how many times they get into a fight or how many times they perform a certain behavior. Or you're watching people at the mall and you're watching like, interactions of some sort and you are gathering data. In this case, uh, in order to do like a clinical observation, we would probably set up what's called an analog observation. And that's what's happening in this image here where you're observing someone through like a two-way mirror. Right, so the idea would be that they can't see you. And so you're recording how they play with certain objects or how they interact with a therapist or a teacher. Anyone, uh, anyone in here taken a class down at our child development center and had an opportunity to do something like this? We have a, a, our child development center down the hill has uh, observation rooms like this. And my oldest went to preschool there for a year 
And it was so fun because I could go down there and watch her without her knowing it um, through these little like glass mirrors because I'm faculty, I was allowed to do that. And so at the end of the day, I'd be like, I saw that thing you did, you know, and she'd have no idea what I'm talking about. But I could walk her through uh, the mirror and see what she was doing and how she was doing. This is very commonly done with children. So if we're trying to gather information, maybe to see if someone has a diagnosis of ADHD or has those criteria, or if they're acting out or have a learning disability, we might watch them playing or interacting without them knowing it. And if you know that you're being watched, it's going to change your behavior, right? Like if you know that somebody's watching you, you're on your best behavior, typically. But after a time, you start to forget and act a little more naturally. And that's the goal with this is that we can get a lot of information about somebody from watching the way that they behave or play or whatever it is that we're, we're looking at. We can also have somebody uh, kind of self-observe. You can self-monitor. You can think about this almost like journaling or keeping like track of a behavior. Let's say that somebody is struggling with addiction. Okay, so maybe we ask them, um, I'd like you to observe, you know, your behaviors around your addiction to cigarettes. Okay, when is it that you're smoking? How did you feel before and after? Are there certain people that maybe are triggering your desire to smoke? And so you're keeping track of every kind of related behavior, looking for patterns and trends and triggers, right? And so you can gather a lot of information by not only maybe monitoring yourself, but also by watching and monitoring like others, like a client, for example. Probably the most common of all of the methods other than the interview uh, are personality inventories. These are used a lot when it comes to psychological assessment. And these are some kind of test that you would take that traditionally have a bunch of different questions on them and you might answer true or false or yes or no or some uh, variation of that. And what happens when you're done with these tests is we tend to get like a printout or a readout of your scores. And this can be very helpful like from a diagnostic point of view. By far the most commonly used personality inventory in terms of clinical assessment is a test called the MMPI. If you've ever heard of it, it stands for a Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory 2, or in the second edition. And it's in desperate need of an update, right? It has some very kind of old um, like terms on there and old phrases that people don't use so much anymore. But this test is an incredibly comprehensive test. Um, and if you took it, you would know it has 567 questions on it. Okay. That's a lot of questions, 567. And you generally answer true, false, or cannot say. Basically, I don't know. So they ask you an incredible variety of questions. And then when you're done, you get like almost like a Scantron printout that would tell you where you fall on a bunch of different scales. And in your textbook, it talks about the different scales on here. There's a scale of how introverted or extroverted you are. There's a scale that has to do with depression. There's one that judges things like um, psychotic behavior. Some of the questions on there, sometimes I hear voices. You would say true, false, or cannot say, right? Um, and then there are random questions like I enjoy house plants, right? I don't know why they have filler questions on here. It's long enough already, but there's quite a few different questions. It's a very widely used personality inventory. Uh, and I've taken this a couple of times and I've administered it a couple of times. Has anyone taken this that you know of? Again, you would probably remember doing it because it's so lengthy. It, it would be something that would be prescribed or like uh, given by a psychologist traditionally in like a school setting um, or maybe like a clinical setting, but it does have some skills that focus on assessing pathology. So it's very commonly used as part of like a battery of assessments. Uh, you might see this being part of it. And again, a really good test but one of the big downsides to it is that it is so long. People get fatigued and they start just answering randomly. So there are even scales built in to see if people have given up or if they're lying. Um, and those are things that we can tend to be able to judge based on the responses that you give to this incredible number of questions. Now, I have a, a much shorter personality inventory to give to you. And this one's very commonly used and it's a good test. I'm giving you some bad ones. This one's really good. And I imagine that some of you have taken a, a, a variation on this before. If you've ever heard of the Myers-Briggs typology indicator, the MBTI, um, it gives you a four letter uh, type of personality. 
Um, this is like a shortened version of it. And I'll show you where you can take the real thing if you would like to. But I'm going to hand this out to you. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do this. And I guarantee some of you have done this before. Does anyone right now know your four-letter type? Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see if it's the same or different. So don't start again. Let me give you just a couple of instructions. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah, Hiring. Yeah, hiring. It's really common we for majors. Like we use it at our um, at our school to help like put people into like different major categories. Yeah, it's a, actually a very good text. I did it over there. Like I planned it. Does everyone have one? I know I planned it. <laughs> All right. So what I want you to do, if you've never taken this before, there are basically four questions on this. So you're going to read the question, and then you're going to read all of the different descriptors. And I want you to pick the ones that are most like you in like a broad sense. So don't think of necessarily how you feel right now, but think about how you tend to feel in general. So question one, what is your natural energy orientation? You're going to read all of the extroverted characteristics and the introverted characteristics and pick the one that is most like you most of the time. Now, I've told you many times at this point that I'm a Gemini. I'm always torn between two things. So if you're like 50-50 split, pick the one that's closest, but maybe mark it down so that you can um, look up both sides. But I'll, I'll stop talking for a minute. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Um, and at the end, you should have a personality four-letter type at the bottom.
So most of you look like you're done just kind of looking around. Uh, and some of you said you've taken this before, but I wrote mine up here. I am an ISFJ. Anyone else? ISFJ? No? One, two, three, a couple people. Uh, I'm always torn. How many of you were torn between two options at some point by a show of hands? A lot of you. So that's an interesting thing that might be kind of like a reliability concern, right? Depending on if you've answered it uh, over time or taken it several times. I consistently get this one, but in my mind, I tend to think of myself as an extrovert, but I always end up being more of an introvert um, when it comes to this test. But I wanted to offer this to you if you're interested, and I don't tend to offer a lot of extra credit, so I would definitely, if you're interested, uh, take me up on this here. But if you want to earn um, up to five points of extra credit, you can go to personalitypathways.com, which is at the top of the sheet that I gave you. It's on there as well. Um, you can look up your four-letter personality type. Now, it has all of them on there. It'll give you an explanation of what it means uh, and common careers and things related to it. And then you can just write up um, handwritten or typed a couple of things. You can describe your type, uh, reactions to your results, and then um, talk a little bit about the standardization, reliability, and validity that we've talked about a few times now. Um, and this would be due next class. So if you're interested in doing that, totally optional for extra credit. And if not, that's fine. But uh, any any like reactions or comments to your, to your test? Those of you who have taken it before, was it the same? Was it different? Any... Any general like thoughts or comments at all? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Which that was like the one that was like mm -hmm. really walking in on, uh, which I guess like again with the fact that you're saying like it's kind of very like, a lot of into it. Yeah. Even though you say like, oh. Like think about it generally, mm -hmm. it's like sometimes it's just like, yeah, right. Your how you're feeling that day or kind of recently can very easily affect your results, right? Luckily, like three out of four were the same, yeah. but one of them, like you said, kind of on the line, was pushed in a different direction today. Anybody, anybody else who's taken it before, same or different? Any other thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And ideally, they should be the same, right? Your personality is something that's very consistent and stable, right? The person that you are when you're born is very similar to the person that you are today, right? That temperament sets the stage for personality. Now, things in our life can definitely shape us in directions, but our personality tends to be pretty consistent. So if this test were good, reliable and valid and so on, you would hope that your results would be relatively stable over time. Now, they might change a little bit depending on things that happen in your life, but they should be somewhat consistent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I changed like. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. It should be similar. Reading and like picking a summary. But if you go to that personalitypathways.com, uh, you can actually take the test on here. See how it says right here, what's your personality type? You can take the actual test where you answer questions and it gives you a type at the end. And so it might be interesting to do as part of that extra credit. You don't have to, but you could take the test on here, see if it's the same as the result you just got um, by doing the summary, right? And you could talk a little bit about that as well. And then on here, you can find out what is your 16 personality types? What do they mean? Uh, so kind of a fun, um, you know, chance to explore it in a slightly different way. But this would be an example of a personality inventory, right? That you took some questions. It tells you a little bit about your personality. And again, this one tends to be a pretty good test. Um, not all personality tests are good, but the MMPI is the one that we tend to use probably um, the most, most often. Okay, so let me go back to this. Yeah. So again, these are typically what we would call like objective tests of personality. An objective test is something that is usually written, right? Like, so it's a written test, it's scored objectively, meaning that we typically run it through a machine and it just scores you based on what you bubbled in or didn't. 
objective tests are very uh, attempt to be very free of bias. They can obviously have issues, but uh, they're very different than the next category of tests that we'll talk about, which are called projective tests. And projective tests are very like vague types of tests. They tend to give you something very unstructured and then you project meaning onto it uh, by giving it a meaning or interpretation yourself. Very, very easy example of a projective test there's a test called the um, sentence completion test. And what they do with this is literally write like half a sentence and then you complete it. And every single one of you will likely have like a different answer or there'll be a lot of different answers based on like what you are thinking. But you might ask something like uh, a very common question, when I see myself in the mirror, I blank, laugh, cry, smile, right? I don't know, you might have a different response for each thing, right? Everybody might say something slightly different. Another really common one is if I only could blank. And I imagine a lot of you had something pop into your head. I won't ask you to share it, right? Because it might be personal, but you would, fill in these sentences and it would say something um, about maybe what was going on in your life, maybe things that are happening, maybe something about your personality. It's a very, very informal test. There's also one called the draw a person test, which is very commonly used with children. You ask a child to draw a picture of themselves and then you analyze what they drew. Uh, and projective tests are not nearly as reliable and valid and standardized as objective ones, there's a lot of room for interpretation, but they can be an interesting thing to add as part of like a battery of assessments. And just for fun, um, I have a little like very informal uh, personality projective test that I kind of came up with based on some ideas here. Um, you're gonna need a blank piece of paper. It could be the back of the test that I just gave you. You're not turning it in, but I do need you to have a blank sheet. So that would be a good one if you have the back of that CSI test. And I'm going to have you draw something for me. Now, I am completely unartistic. Like, stick figures are tough for me. So if you are in the same boat, don't feel bad. Uh, but what I want you to do is I, I would like all of you on that piece of paper to draw me a blivet. And I'm going to give you just like a minute or so. Don't look up what a blivet is. If you're sitting there going, I have no idea what that is, that is the point. I want you to draw me whatever you think of when you think of a blender. What does that remind you of? What do you think of? What is it in your mind? I will tell you that drawing nothing is almost more meaningful than drawing something. So pick something, but draw it on that back blank piece of paper. And I know if you're a very like concrete person like I am, you're probably really annoyed with me right now for not knowing what this is. I will show you what a blivet is in a moment, but come up with something, right? What do you think a blivet is? Draw it on the back of that piece of paper, and then we'll, uh, kind of playfully analyze it a little bit. I'm not going to look at you because some of you look annoyed, but I'm going to just you go ahead and draw it to the best of your ability. <laughs> I made my uh, colleagues draw this when they were glaring at me too, but I mean, apparently it went okay, but you know, it's kind of funny. Made them do the same. Give just another minute or so to perfect your your little bit master. <laughs>
What is cool is I can tell you, walking through the room, not a single one of you do the same thing. Like everybody do something completely different from each other, which is really cool. Okay, so if you are a concrete thinker and you're like, I, I need to know, right? This is what a blivet is. It's an actual thing, but I chose something completely obscure. Yeah, it's like an impossible figure where that like prong disappears and kind of goes back and forth. It's a something we sometimes talk about in sensation and perception, but I chose something purposefully like really vague and hopefully something none of you knew what it was. If you knew what a blivet was, it kind of ruins the point of the activity. But every single one of you put something on your piece of paper, even if it was just a dot or a question mark, right? uh, there's something. So in general, for uh, these kind of projective tests, when people draw something, we can make some general conclusions from the things that they draw. And so I'll share this with you. Keep this in mind now that uh, this may or may not mean anything. And it might be totally dependent on your artistic ability more than meaning anything about your personality. Okay, But in general, I had you draw it on a blank piece of paper because the size and the location of where you drew it on the paper sometimes are meaningful as well. Right. So in general, people who drew something that is very small on your piece of paper, it tends to represent insecurity or shyness. Or we could back up and say it represented uncertainty in your artistic ability or like, you know, lack of a, knowing what a blivet is. But generally it uh, represents being insecure or shy. If it's very large on your piece of paper, it tends to mean that you tend to be more confident or assertive in your life. May or may not be true. If you drew nothing, right, um, which none of you did, which is great, um, or not that I saw, it might mean that you're overwhelmed or you have like a lack of confidence. It could have been a lack of confidence in your artistic ability, but it could be also in general in your life. Uh, is your picture literal or creative? A lot of you, a couple of you drew like a hot air balloon or like a hot air balloon or like a blimp kind of thing, like blivet kind of reminds me of like a blimp. Right. Um, is it very literal versus I saw some like creatures over here? Like, is that a cat? Right. Or yeah. Right. A couple of you drew more like an animal, almost like a fictional animal. Are you someone who tends to be more literal or more creative in the way that you think? Um, could be something that means something there. The top of the page versus the middle versus the bottom. If you drew your image at the top of the page, you tend to be someone who's more optimistic in general. In the middle of the page, more realistic, and at the bottom of the page, more pessimistic. So sometimes where you place the image can be meaningful. Was it detailed or simple, right? That might be reflective of your personality. It was something that was very involved. Some of you really took your time. Others did something very quick, right? That might, again, be meaningful or not. Uh, was the pressure on it? Light pressure tends to indicate like a low level of energy or confidence. Heavy pressure are very like uh, like thick lines on your paper, maybe more confidence, more energy. So all these little things are stuff that we would look for in a projective test, right? So when a child draws a picture of themselves, we look at all those things. Are there other people in the picture? What are they doing in the picture? Really interesting, a random little thing, buttons. Buttons on, a, um, on an image that somebody draws tend to represent the level of like vanity that they have. Right? So if you ask a child to draw a picture of themselves and they have big buttons on their shirt, that tends to be something that's meaningful. Um, the people in it, the activities that they're doing and so on. So all of these like projective tests, we're looking for like hidden meanings that might be projected out onto that piece of paper. So you can, uh, you can hide or destroy or put away your, your blivet uh, if you would like. Sorry if that was a, a little bit stressful for you. But in general, we can take some things from it. Projective tests aren't perfect, but they can yield some kind of interesting information. There are two really common projective tests that are used. Uh, the first one, probably the less common of the two, is called the thematic apperception test or the TAT. Themes, you're coming up with a theme or a story. So in this test, what we do is we show um, the client a very kind of grainy, ambiguous picture like this one, this is an actual image from the test, right? And so we show an image like this, and then we have you come up with a story. What's happening in this picture? What's about to happen? What are these people thinking, right? You come up with a whole little story around this event. And again, the idea is that you are projecting from your mind onto this test, 
right? Something that might be going on in your life. Now, one picture might not be meaningful, but if there's something that repeatedly comes up in these images, maybe it's happening in your life or you kind of put it out there. You also have to take into account some people are just very creative and good storytellers. And that might be, it might have nothing to do with their life. It's kind of up to the therapist to decide. But what I want you to do, I want you to find a couple of people around, just like two, three people, whatever's uh, right in you. What's happening in this picture? And there's no wrong answer. There are definitely like more common answers. There's no wrong one. But um, as a group of like two or three of you, what's going, what's going on here? And then we'll talk about it together. So just whatever's easy around you. Talk about it for a minute. <laughs> Yeah, I was like looking for the second Disney character. No, or what do you think, Brett? Um, what's going on in this picture? And again, there's no right or wrong answer. I promise not to like interpret anything. So, yeah. And get here, boss. No, no, that's perfect. And no, that's very common. A lot of people talk about this as someone who's younger, worrying about or thinking about when they're older, or vice versa, someone who's older and young, worrying about or thinking back on when they were younger. Other people, yeah. So she's like fighting her own beauty. So like she's fighting a, a piece of herself that she doesn't like and some attraction that's her kind of Okay. She seems stressed and she's living for this. Okay. Great. Great. Yeah. Yeah, like super similar in that was that one. Um like I was saying, like the old one is just like her inner self and like her inner self is like ugly and like rapid. Okay. And sort of like outer self is like this Okay. It's, I kind of saw it. Sure. Okay. I like it. Yeah. Other thoughts? I thought of Rapunzel when I. Sure. <laughs> Mother Gothel in the back, right? Or what? <laughs> I always think of um of like Valak. Anyone seen the nun? Right. Like I'm like, it's Valak the Defiler <laughs> in the back, like the evil nun, right? Not nearly as creepy, and this one's got like a smile. There's like a mischievous something going on. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's relatively common now. Um, before that, a lot of people would think of like Snow White. Like, do you want an apple kind of thing? You know, like she's like the evil, um, like offering an apple. Yeah. Sure. It seems like there's almost like a lot of between them. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Right. I, I can kind of see what you're talking about. Okay. Anybody, anybody else? Any other takes on this? I have one more for you, but anything else? Okay. Next one. Same thing with your group. Right. This one is a little more, I could say it's a little richer in content. I don't know. Uh okay. So with your group again, what's happening? What's happening here? Go ahead and talk about it for a minute and we'll talk together. Well, I was and she did not just lost our time. She 
Say girls extracted. I need to get back. But yeah, I think that's keeping him away from his homework. <laughs> All right, so what's happening in this uh, in this picture here? Uh, there's a lot of interpretations we could take of this picture. Anyone want to? Anyone want to start us off? Yeah, what's going on? Really likes this girl. She's distracting him from the school because that's why he's facing towards the books. Okay. All right, great. I have to focus. I have a test tomorrow. <laughs> All right. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How many of you thought there was some like foul? play here that's pretty normal and everyone's always afraid to say it like you're gonna appear like you're a murderer or something like that no it's really she doesn't look like she's in like a natural full of life position right there's something very like off about the way that she's laying yeah it was an exorcism and he's like black and white it's interesting also i noticed that she's like the wrong way the board or whatever uh-huh it's like kind of the Interesting. Okay. And there's something very off about the bed, right? It's like a very small bed. Now, these are dated images. They tend to be older and um, single beds were much more common, like if you go back into like the 50s or so. But uh, yeah, that, that could be interesting to think about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's a great example of how things in your life that like maybe you just had like some exposure to kind of infiltrate their way in. Right. Anybody else? Yeah. He noticed that. She calls you out. I'm sorry. Like, it. yeah. He noticed that one of the digits are off. So oh, I think okay. like something is going on with that. Like it just doesn't seem normal. Like, okay. Like it fell off during the exorcism. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, so you're putting it all together. It's coming yeah. together. Yeah. Okay. He just found her there or he kills her and he feels like the guilt and his crime or something. Okay. All right. Anybody else? There's one more like really common theme that nobody has has mentioned. Yeah. Um, he's going to work. Okay. He's going to work. Yeah, he's all dressed, right? Dressed up. Yeah. <laughs> just you know, getting back on the right. One night stand, very common one. Nobody mentioned like they just had sex. And like he's getting dressed, or like next morning, like, oh, what happened? Right? Like, he's all unhappy with it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things that have come up in this picture. I had somebody in my class uh, last semester say that this was a woman, right? That had, um, but was dressed in a very masculine way. But, so maybe that's something that like correlated to her life in some way. Hard to, hard to know. Yeah. Well, since she brought up the one that's there, like, kind of seems like maybe he they do it or something, and then like he's like, Sure. Yeah, guilty or like look away, right? Uh, interestingly, uh, a lot of people talk about themes of like he walked in and found her dead. Then maybe it's a dad who walked in and found his daughter had committed suicide, right? And uh, and so you get a theme of like suicidality, and he's looking away because he doesn't want to like look at her. Uh, 
really uncommon would be to look at this and be like, well, his eyes are tired because he was reading, right? You completely ignore the sexuality in the picture, right? So you look for themes to emerge. So let's say somebody, um, you show them this image and it's somebody um, is describing this and they say, well, it's an older person thinking back on when they were younger and they're really unhappy and they're thinking about taking their life because they hate where they're at right now. And then they get here and they're like, oh, it's a dad who just walked in and found his daughter had committed suicide. Right now we have two images where somebody has brought up like suicidality and that might be reflective of that being on their mind. Maybe or maybe not. That's up to the therapist again to kind of figure out. But you tend to look for themes and abnormal responses. Uh, I will share with you that I had one very abnormal response to this, uh, to the last image. And uh, it has stuck with me for years, almost to the point where I stopped showing these in class because of it. So when my first class I ever taught uh, in Colorado, uh, I had a young man who said that this was a man in the front. I don't know if anyone else thought that. They kind of purposefully made this person uh, very like ambiguous. So it could be male or female. I tend to see this person as female, but it could go either way. So this student in my class was like, it's a young man who just told his grandma that he plans to shoot a bunch of people at school tomorrow. And she's concerned um, and like worried and trying to talk him out of it. And he said this in the middle of class, and he went on to talk about how it was like his psychology class that he was planning to murder a bunch of people in. And I had to like report this student and take him to the counseling office. And like nobody wanted to come in the next class because they were terrified that he was going to come back and like hurt everyone. Uh, funny side note, he contacted me 10 years later and apologized. He's like, I'm sorry, I was going through a dark time. Thank you for getting me help. Um, and it all worked out fine, but that would be a very abnormal response. And I have to tell you, it caused me so much anxiety and my students, like nobody came for a week. Everyone was so scared um, and it turned out just fine. But stuff like that, like that is a very specific random thing that that student came up with. And he admitted later that it was something that he had considered because he felt socially like outcasted by his peers. Um, and so people tend to like project little things in their life onto these images and you look for themes and you look for abnormal responses like that one and I only share it with you because I think it was very uh, meaningful in that in that case was that a or, uh, so basically this test did work for him yeah okay. yeah like, yeah like, yeah uh, yeah great right. yeah and I could have completely ignored it, right? And been like, oh, he's just being creative. But like, he was kind of an intimidating guy. And he said it in a very intimidating way. And I took it very seriously, thankfully. And, and everything was fine. But like, people will often put stuff out there. They don't realize that it's meaningful, right? And it could have been him just being creative. I mean, kind of a dark, twisted sense of creativity. But that could have just been something he put out there. Um, it turned out not to be. Yeah. How did I? Yeah. Was he in the middle of class? We were in the middle of class, just How like this. How did the rest of the people left? There were several people who left, and um, I couldn't blame them, you know. And we ended early, and I took him to the counseling office. Um, and so, honestly, it threw me. I was not expecting that. Um, and I, I mean, I felt like I handled it fine, but yeah, it uh, it definitely was. Um, not expected. So I'm always in the back of my mind every time I show this picture. I'm like, what are they going to say? But you know, everything you said was totally within the realm of like expected responses. There's a, a realm of like normality, and then there's responses that are really outside of that, right? And those are things that therapists would look for. Yeah. When you give specific pictures, they have to correct. Yeah. There, something's going on, but big enough. Yeah. To pull your brain. Right, you're leaving it open to the person to decide what's happening. So they have to be, and they're all kind of grainy and old like this, um, allowing people to kind of interpret them how they look. So this is one test, much more commonly used as this one. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the Rorschach inkblot test before, uh, created by a man named Herman Rorschach back in the 1920s. Uh, he literally dropped ink on a piece of paper, folded it in half and unfolded it get mirror images and he would show them to people and say what do you see right and this one um, much more ambiguous right than um than the pictures but what you do is you show these to people and say you know what are what are the things that you see in this picture and you look at how many things they see you look for themes and, and so on 
Um, and it's very standardized now. These are actual images from the, uh, the test. So again, with your group, take a minute, right? What do you see in these two images? Again, no right or wrong answers. Uh, but there are definitely common things. Like I see two bears high five. Right? I don't know. Uh, but find a, take a minute with your group. What do you see in these pictures? Yeah. This one, anyone? Uh, anyone see anything in this picture? I always picture. Uh, I see like a warlock with no head. I don't. I don't know why he has no head. But here's this little man with his neck and his torso and his feet, and he's got like a cape or something. His head's gone. I don't know why. Um, anybody? I'll put that out there just to help you feel better about whatever you see. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Beetle or a bug? Yeah. And then we'll come back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I like it. What, how about for you? Uh, butterfly, spider, goat's head. Yeah. Okay. Those are all really common ones, too. Anybody else see something? Yeah. Okay. Okay. With four eyes. With four eyes. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Something Batman like has. Okay. Like has a beautiful kid. Okay. <laughs> New Batman or old Batman, right? Which no. Batman? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Like a mask is really common or like a face. Sometimes people see like a pelvic bone tends to be kind of common as well. How about the one on the right? Other than two bears or clowns high-fiving. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Other stuff? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Anybody else? Yeah. I saw like a hat with like a wind Okay. Interesting. And that's always interesting to look at too. Do people, when they look at these, do they see the void or do they see the black? Do they see the white or the black first? Like when I first look at this, I see the two bears or clown or whatever high fiving. But then I almost see like a spinning top in the middle. And that's the next thing I see. And it's funny because once somebody points it out and you see it, it's hard to unsee it in a way. I heard somebody say that somewhere too. Um, there's one more really common one. This one uh, is a very famous one also from the test. Uh, and this one's in color. A few of them do have some color in it. So I'll give you a minute with your group as well. What's going on in, in this one? You can go ahead and talk. Oops. Yeah. 
that's like an underwater feel too. Yeah. Doesn't kind of have like an underwater vibe. Are we what uh, what are some things that you see here? I will tell you like today when I looked at it, the first thing I saw pliers. I was like, oh, I see a pair of like you know those pliers. Somebody doing some construction. I, that's the first thing that popped into my head. But uh, what else do you see? Yeah. The first thing we saw was like a like a deer skull or something at the very top. Okay. But then I started like pulling the body like down from that. Mm -hmm. So like there's like a of them that were like moving and then like a bra. Uh yeah. And then like uh, mm -hmm. frog legs. Okay. Yeah, I can totally see that. But I can't unsee it, right? <laughs> yeah. So like wow. Flowers like growing up more than the Eiffel Tower. Yeah, like, Eiffel Tower, flowers, other people, anything else? Yeah. That's all like insects. Insects, very common. Farm shaped insects. Yeah. Those so blotches on the side, maybe the brown, uh, dark, like the black, brown, and um, brown green beetle kind of shape. Sure. Okay, other people? Is that again? Yeah, you're yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, you're here. Uh, I see like some a pair of lungs with like the the esophagus, you know what I mean? Like the top part. Okay. Yeah. They kind of kind of have like lungs. Okay. Like anatomy or like underwater scenes or like a garden scene are very common. Anybody see anything else that you want to share? Anything else? Just trying to get you to share. Do you want to? I'll I'll have a great I don't know. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and um, interesting that you said that, like, I'll see these as ovaries with an egg in it sometimes, right? Um, and this picture for me has been kind of interesting that over time, like, I've used this picture in a class for, for many years, and for a long time, I saw, like, a scene from, like, the Aliens movies, that's the Queen Alien up at the top, I, I don't know, it just reminded me of the Queen, like, Alien with the long head, and then um, I would see like an underwater scene when we were trying to get pregnant with our children. I saw like ovaries with an egg in them. That was the first thing because it was on my mind. Today, like I said, I saw flyers. We've been doing a bathroom renovation. I don't know, maybe that's why that came into my head. Or I see like a scene from Sophia the First when they go and see the mermaids. I've seen this way too many times. So right, where they go and they're floating on their palace and these are mermaids. And it's the whole like underwater scene. That's like the other thing that pops into my head. Again, the idea with these is that stuff in your life may or may not kind of creep its way into these pictures. And so, again, it's up to the therapist to decide. But in general, if we see themes emerging, like somebody here is like, you know, this is a, a scene with aliens. We go back here, it's two aliens high-fiving. This is definitely an alien, right? Like you see, I mean, that would be really obvious. But oftentimes people will put that kind of stuff on there. And aliens represent feeling alienated or lonely or different from other people. So uh, that tends to be how these are used. Now, you would never use something like this alone. This would not be the only test that you gave somebody. But as part of like a battery of assessments, it might be really helpful or meaningful. And again, these tests don't tend to be great by themselves. But people might reveal something interesting without realizing that they're revealing it when you show them these, these pictures. Any other like thoughts or comments or anything about these before I keep going? They're kind of fun to to play with, right? To look at. I always enjoy looking at them. Yeah. I was gonna say, are you just like slowly diagnosing us? No. <laughs> no. Oh, no. <laughs> right. No. No. And that takes a lot of effort, right? And that's a really common stereotype, right? Of people who teach or like are therapists that they're constantly diagnosing. It's exhausting to do, right? No, I promise not, or at least not for the most part. I'm just kidding. All right, so once we've done this battery of assessments, we've gathered all this information, right? Then what we're gonna do is arrive at a diagnosis. 
A diagnosis is a determination that your symptoms, your issues, your presenting problems reflect a particular disorder or maybe disorders, right? Sometimes we diagnose people with more than one. Now, we are currently in the DSM-5. The DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's uh, this large book that contains all of the diagnoses, all of the mental illnesses that we currently recognize. Now, in the old DSM, we would do it this way. And so I want to I want to cover this because some people still use it. So just as an example, and this is old one. I did an escape room not that long ago that had Roman numerals in it. And I was like, oh, thank God. I at least know what a few of them are, <laughs> right? Uh, it was so tricky. We had to do math with like Roman numerals. Not, not my favorite. Uh, but with these, what we would do is we would look at all those symptoms and then decide what is going on with somebody. And on axis one, we'd look at five levels, five axes. Axis one, we would determine what clinical disorders do we think this person is struggling with. So I'm going to give you, this is an example. Example. So let's say we think this person has major depression or unipolar depression. So that's an example of what a clinical disorder would be. So I'm just kind of giving you an example of what this could look like. Access two is always things that are global. Now it says mental retardation that has been finally like replaced with intellectual developmental disorder, but this is what it said back at the time. So I left it. Uh, but if a person has like a global um, thing going on, like a personality disorder or something global, like an intellectual um, disorder, we would put it here. Let's say this person. Axis three, we're going to write down anything that might be medically going on in this person's life that could influence their diagnosis, right? So what we're doing here is we're considering anything medical that might potentially affect someone's depression. So let's say that this person has um, obesity and diabetes. So people who have diabetes, sometimes their blood sugars, when they fluctuate, it can affect their mood, right? So it might be something worth noting that uh, maybe these things are kind of exacerbating or affecting their depression in some way. Access four, we're going to put any kind of like environmental or like social things in this person's life that might be affecting them. So let's give this poor person something tragic that happened. What's something sad that could happen to this person? Yeah, this, what was that? Dad. Their dad died. That's so sad. Let's give them one more. Let's make it really bad. <laughs> what else? Their mom died. Their mom died. Oh Everybody, mom died. And they lost their job. Oh, man. This poor person. All in the same week. All on the same day. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. On the same week. Right? So this poor person had these tragic things happen, right? Uh, jokingly, obviously, this is a fictional person, but these would be things in their environment that could very easily be affecting their depression and probably very prominently affecting their depression. So global assessment of functioning would go down here. This is going to be a score between zero to 100 that reflects how we think this person is doing. The lower the score, the worse they're doing, the higher the score, the better they're doing. Nobody ever really gets a zero or a hundred. It's like, we could say this person not doing well, you give them like a third. So it gives this idea of like a numerical indicator of how well or poorly this individual is doing. Now this is the old system. We've actually made it so much easier. I like the new one over here. Would that score be like arbitrary or like super subjective? It's just up to the therapist and it might change every session. So that's one big limitation, right? It's totally up to them. So the new method is we say diagnosis. So we would write um, major depression. And then after that, we're going to give a severity rating. And this is typically between zero to five, right? So we give a rating saying if it's intense or not, let's give this person, let's say it's uh, relatively severe, so let's give you 
And then underneath it, we can say any additional information. So this is where we would write um, like that they have diabetes, that the parents died, and so on. So this is the newer method. It's way cleaner in a way, but I might ask you either because sometimes people still use this one since the DSM-4 was, uh, it's not that many years removed. We're like, we're less than like 10 years removed or right around 10. So sometimes people still use this, but in both cases, we're including all this other information. It's not just, well, that person has depression, right? We're also talking about are there any medical things that might affect that? Are there any environmental things that might affect that? We're trying to take all of that context into effect or into account. And this can change. You might diagnose someone and then you learn more or you work with them longer and the diagnosis changes over time. Uh, but you do typically have to diagnose someone as part of mental health like counseling. Typically for insurance, they require a diagnosis, which can be a little bit mixed in the way that we um, view that. Did you have a uh, it's usually um, like one to five or zero to five. So once we diagnosed somebody, we give them that label, if you will. And I imagine a lot of you at some point in your life have had a label put on you. Maybe it's a good one. Maybe it's a bad one. Somebody told you you're gifted or that you're slow or that you have ADHD or that you have depression or that whatever it might be, right? When you give somebody a label or a diagnosis, Sometimes that can have issues. It can change the way that you view yourself, right? And oftentimes people will embrace labels for better or worse, and it can cause problems, right? We might end up viewing a person differently. If you ever met somebody and they have behavior that's kind of odd, and then you find out that they have a disorder and it changes the way you view them. Like I've had that moment where I've been like super insensitive and then I'm like, oh, they have autism and I should have viewed this totally differently. It flips my view of their behavior on its head, right? Like, and so that happens to us a lot. It might make you view the person differently, make different judgments about them. And we can even create like self-fulfilling prophecies, right? Like if I were to find out, like take the two of you, for example, like your counselors reach out to me, this would never happen. And they're like, you know, he's really bored in class. Make sure you stimulate him. If he's not doing so great, it's because he's bored. And they're like, oh, he's lazy. He doesn't like to work. He doesn't want to be in college. Right. So that's what's going on. I'm going to view your scores very differently depending on what I've been told. And it may or not be accurate. I know nothing about that. It's, there is no counselor to tell me those things, but it could change reality, it changes the way you view someone. So there are a lot of people who criticize this whole system because when we label someone or diagnose someone, it can lead to problems. And I uh, have a brother, I have two brothers. My youngest brother was diagnosed with um, ADHD when he was younger, and he just had a lot of energy, but it changed his whole perception of himself, right? He's like, well, I have ADHD, like that, and it just like almost became like his scapegoat for everything. Um, and when he was older, like it was like, oh, you probably didn't have that. You were just kind of a hyperactive kid, but within the realm, realm of like normal. And so sometimes it can be problematic to give people a diagnosis. Yeah. Um, if we were to like change that and say that diagnosis would seem to have more harm than good, what would be the other? Yeah. Solution? And that's the issue, right? There isn't really another solution. So uh, that's something that we have to always weigh, right? Is it harmful or helpful? There is no other like proposed um, system in place. This is the system that we have for better or worse. And labels can also be really helpful. If I know you have depression, now I know to use techniques that work with depression on you. Right, so there are pluses and minuses to labeling someone or diagnosing someone. And unfortunately, we don't have another system. So it is the one that we use for, for better or worse. Did you have a? I think this is like a real study. I can't like fully completely remember it. My teacher is like, they took like a set of children and one set they like, um, you avoided like their behavior and they said, oh, like anything that they did well. Yeah. They like, positive reinforcement. Whereas, uh, the other set of children, they like anything yeah. they did bad, they would tell them and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, and like the kids who like were getting yelled at and stuff like that, like it kind of stuck with them for the, yeah. their entire life. Like, uh, they were like really timid and stuff like that. Whereas the people who are doing good behavior, 
uh, we're super like outgoing. Yeah. Like that. So it's like it's similar to that. Like just by how people like perceive you or whatever. Yes. You know, you're like, well, that's a great example. And that stuff sits with people. I mean, if you tell somebody something about themselves and view it in that way, it can have a long-term effect. And that, again, is one of these downsides to labeling. But if I know that you have a disorder, again, that's helpful. Now I know how to help you because I know what you have. Sometimes identifying what somebody has going on is the most helpful thing you can do. You know, if you have a medical disorder and they figure it out, now I know what treatments to go to, right? And so, again, a little bit mixed, but once we have a diagnosis, then what we're going to do is decide on treatment, right? So let's say, again, you have depression, our fictional person here, right? If someone has depression, depending on the disorder, depending on their background, we're going to choose a mode of therapy that's going to be the most helpful or techniques that might be the most helpful. And in general, therapy does tend to be helpful. About 80% of people who go to therapy do improve um, over time. And it depends on a lot of things, of course. Like if you go into therapy saying, this isn't going to help me, I refuse to be motivated, I'm not doing anything, it's not going to help you. But if you go in and you're more motivated and you have milder things and you're motivated to change, it's probably going to be very helpful. So there's a lot of factors in play and there tend to be certain types of therapies that are better for certain types of problems. As we talked about before, like with depression, cognitive therapy is really helpful. With phobias, behavioral flooding or like exposure therapies tend to be really helpful. So we always have to consider the client and their wishes along with the disorder and the things going on when we're coming up with like a treatment plan for an individual, right? And it might include a lot of different elements, right? Depending on what our goal is and what, what's going on in that person's life. But we would give them a diagnosis. And unfortunately we have to do that um, in terms of insurance and like medical records. So this can change at any time. And sometimes it does, it does change over time. So um, some of you did this already, but I have a homework assignment for you. Uh, and so what I wanna talk about, this will pop up on Canvas in six minutes. I changed it and made sure. So if you saw this pop up before and you did it already, hold on to it, bring it with you Thursday. But this will be done, uh, this will be due on Thursday. Um, so what you're gonna do, and these questions are on Canvas, they'll pop up there as well. Uh, but there's a, a book that was written called The Myth of Mental Illness. This is a very old book, but it's an argument that's still referenced a lot today. And I wanted you to have an opportunity to kind of think critically and get a polar opposite perspective. This is not in any way a commonly accepted belief, but it is the opposite of like the mainstream of diagnosing and mental illness that we're talking about all semester. So that would be a nice opportunity for you to see the other side. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna read um, the little excerpt that's going to pop up on Canvas, and then answer three questions related to it. And this will be due next class. You can hand write it or type it. Um, if you're not going to be here on Thursday for whatever reason, you can email it to me. But let me show you really quickly on um, Canvas here. Let me bring that up. So that means I have to try and remember my password. Oh, look, it's saved. So nice. Too many passwords, right? Uh, so if you're on our Canvas page, and again, this will pop up in about five minutes, so don't worry if you don't see it yet. But on our page, thank you. Yeah, I teach, I'm teaching seven classes, if you're wondering why there's so many. Uh, so right here under announcements, See right here, myth of mental illness homework. Like I said, it'll pop up in, uh, in like five minutes. But when it does pop up, this is what it looks like. So here's the three questions, a reminder that it's due on Thursday. And here's the article. So if you click on that, it's going to bring up this little excerpt from the article. Now, I did go through and read it. If you'd like to listen to it, I have it right here as like an audio file. If you miss the sound of my voice between now and Thursday, anyway, uh, some people would rather listen to it than read it. Uh, I forget what it is. There's a word in there that I like could not pronounce. So you can laugh at me when I get there. But um, I did read it to you if you'd like it that way. But this is an excerpt. So it's, it's a couple of pages long. Uh, but read through this. And then what you're going to do is summarize and answer those three questions that were on that last on the announcement right here. So uh, what is his main idea that he's presenting? What are some of the reasons he presents as support or claims? Um, do you agree with him? And feel free, please have your own opinion. Do you agree with him? Yes or no, a little bit, maybe under some circumstances, violently disagree, whatever you feel or think is great. And then I want you to think about this. Do diagnoses stigmatize people? In what ways does diagnosing someone might help or hinder them? 
So those are the three questions I'd like you to answer. Uh, um, and then again, that will pop up in a couple of minutes. Also remember that I offered this to you earlier. If you would like, I'll leave it up if you want to take a picture of it. If you'd like to go onto that website and kind of look up your personality type that we talked about earlier, um, that will also be due on Thursday. So uh, a couple of things there. Are there any questions about the homework or that the extra credit and that? And then on Thursday, we'll talk about it. I'll collect it. And then we move on to getting anxious. We get to move on to the anxiety disorders um, on Thursday, which is very exciting. So um, I'll stop there. I'll leave that up in case you want to take a picture or write it down. And then I will see you all on Thursday. Make sure you signed in. Um, all the books up here. Thank you.